Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for um, connecting to this virtual session and to listening to my talk. Uh, I am Pavel Tolar. Uh, I'm a group leader at the Francis Crick Institute in London, and I'm going to talk today about the principles of uh, genome-wide CRISPR-Cas9 screening with particular focus on immune cells. I will start by introducing you to the role of B-lymphocyte in uh, antibody responses, the topic uh, of research of my lab. Uh, I will explain uh, what the previous limitations were in genetic manipulation uh, in immune cells, then uh, introduce the principles of the new uh, pooled CRISPR-Cas9 screening, and then go into detail of the design, execution, and analysis of these screens. I will then give you examples uh, of the screens that we have done in the lab for various functions uh, in B lymphocytes. And I will close uh, with conclusions and outlook uh, for this technology uh, into the future. Okay, so my lab is interested in how immune cells detect and respond to pathogens, and we are particularly focusing on the antibody response. As you know, antibody production is initiated by uh, B lymphocytes or B cells, and B cells are present in large numbers in lymphoid organs, and each of them um, carries a, a unique B cell receptor on their uh, surface that carries a different specificity uh, for antigen. So the presence of a certain pathogen selects and activates um, a certain B cells, certain B cell clones from the naive repertoire, and these B cell clones expand, they proliferate, and eventually differentiate into antibody secreting cells called plasma cells that produce large amounts of antibody that can fight off uh, the pathogen. So as you can see, this response is mediated by decisions of individual B cells to activate to divide, to differentiate into plasma cells, and eventually to die. Now, on the molecular level, um, these decisions are mediated by a complex intracellular signaling network. The network is triggered by binding of foreign antigens to the B cell receptor, and then involves multiple interconnected signaling branches, which also take input from other inflammatory signals. Um, the decisions also require B cell interacting with helper T cells, and that requires it another function of the B cell receptor to physically capture and endocytose the antigens and deliver them into antigen processing compartments where antigenic peptides can be loaded onto MHC class II proteins. And the display of MHC class II proteins on B cell surfaces allows collaboration and interaction uh, with these helper T cells. So the complexity of the network reflects um, the complexity of the immune system and, and the challenge to make the fate decisions correctly. And we know that even a slight imbalance in these networks can turn protection from pathogens into immune disease. For example, defects that reduce the ability of B cells to respond will leave the system in immune deficiency. Because the B cell repertoire is generated randomly, there's always cells that are self-reactive and these have to be suppressed correctly, otherwise they can um, cause autoimmune diseases. B cells can also respond to material that is foreign, but otherwise innocuous, such as allergens, and that's, this could lead to overproduction of IgE and allergic disease. And because the generation of the B cell repertoire involves DNA recombination and somatic mutations, uh, inappropriately activated B cells are also a common um, source of B cell malignancies in the form of leukemias and lymphomas. So to understand how B cells respond to antigens, we need to understand how um, the signaling decision networks inside of them work. And we now know this involves thousands of genes, so we would really benefit from high throughput, robust genetic um, approaches. Unfortunately, the previous um, technologies were not up to the task. The screening that uh, had been developed in lower organisms can be applied to the mammalian immune system. And um, um, manipulation of somatic cells through approaches such as siRNA or TALENS has uh, turned out to be quite inefficient in immune cells and in B cells particularly. So they are um, again quite inadequate for um, high throughput screening approaches.
So this all changed with um, the um, discovery of the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, DNA targeting system, which uh, I'm sure you're very familiar with. The advantage of the system is that it does not rely on any endogenous uh, machinery, but brings directly the Cas9 uh, nuclease via a, a um, guide RNA to um, a site, specific site on the DNA. And the advantage is that um, the system is very efficient and works very robustly um, even in immune cells. And this opened the field to high throughput screening approaches. There are two um, um, screening designs that can be used with CRISPR-Cas9 approaches. The first is array library screening in which essentially each guide is read individually uh, in a well um, in a plate and that allows screening for a broad range of phenotypes, including uh, time-lapse and dynamic assays. But it's expensive and requires high throughput sample handling facilities, as well as extensive um, controls and normalization. But because of the presence of the guides in the cells can be read out uh, by sequencing, um, this technology is also um, amenable to pooled library screening. The uh, pooled library screening is much less expensive and does not require any specialized equipment. It's limited to one readout per screen and also can screen only for cell intrinsic functions, but it is by far the, the simplest um, genome-wide screening um, technology available today. So how does pooled library screening work? Well, it starts with a, um, a library of plasmids, each containing one guide RNA that is typically packaged into viruses to be able to transduce them into cells in such a way that results in each cell containing one guide um, RNA. Um, the uh, cells are then selected for the presence of the guides and they're subjected to, uh, to an assay, which can be just growth and survival assay, or it could be some sort of assay that's able to isolate or sort out uh, responders from non-responders. And the different um, cell populations are then sequenced for the presence of the guides. And uh, from the frequency of the guide RNAs, uh, you can then um, measure the effect of the gene, of the corresponding gene, on that particular um, cellular process. So uh, let's look at um, uh, these individual steps in a little bit more detail. The first thing to consider is the scale of the experiments. Um, whole genome libraries typically contain 4 to 10 guide RNAs per gene, so that results in 50 to 200,000 um, plasmids uh, or guide RNAs. Uh, in the library. So that means that both the plasmids and the cells need to be uh, handled at scale to maintain the complexity in the library. So on, in cell numbers, that translates to um, carrying out the experiments with approximately 10 to 200 million of cells. The complexity of the library uh, is quite easily um, uh, assayed again by high throughput sequencing of the guide RNAs, where you're looking for this um, normal uh, distribution of the guide RNAs uh, frequencies with very little or very few guides um, uh, missing from the library. The second thing to consider is how are cells containing guide RNAs selected and how the guide uh, targeting efficiency is assayed. So selection is typically done um, using drug markers present in the plasmid, but also can be done using fluorescent uh, sorting. The targeting efficiency can be assayed by analyzing the frequency of guide RNAs that target known essential genes. So for this, you can compare the guide RNA uh, frequency in the cell population to that in the original uh, library using this uh, formula shown here and calculate so-called CRISPR score. So if you then plot the CRISPR score for um, various genes in the library, you can see what the genes, um, what, the, what the effect of the genes on the cells have been. So for non-targeting controls, the values cluster around zero as the, these um, guides are having no effect on the cells. But uh, as shown here in blue for um, top 200 um, known essential genes, the CRISPR scores are well below zero, and that is a measure of the targeting efficiency in the experiment.
perhaps the most important step in the screen is design of the readout. There are three types of experiments. In the first one, um, the cells are essentially assayed for growth and so can identify genes that are essential. In the second one, um, you can apply negative selection during the growth, um, resulting in overgrowth only of a few select clones. And so these um, screens can identify genes important for sensitivity to that treatment. But you can also subject the cells to um, assays that allow you eventually to sort um, the cells into two populations. For example, using flow cytometry. And this way you can screen for almost any cell intrinsic uh, phenotype. The final consideration is for the analysis of the screen results. As I explained before, um, the uh, screens are read out by sequencing of the guide RNAs and by comparing their frequencies in the different populations. And this is expressed by this CRISPR score um, as shown here. The CRISPR scores of individual guide RNAs are then averaged uh, per gene, and that gives you the strength of the effect of each gene on the assayed phenotype. And the statistical significance of that gene effect is typically derived from ranking the individual guide RNA CRISPR scores um, against all the other CRISPR scores in the screen. So from all these results, you can eventually call out statistically significant hits in the screen. Okay, now I want to show you two examples of screens that we've done in B lymphocytes, just to give you a better flavor for the implementation of these screens and the results you can expect. The first screen uh, was focused on uh, endocytosis of the B cell receptor, which I explained um, is a critical function in B cells that um, establishes collaboration with helper T cells. But um, previously, the composition, the molecular composition of the endocytic pathways in B cells was a big unknown. So for this screen, we used a pooled guide RNA library that was delivered uh, by a lentiviral transduction into a B-cell line called Ramos that already expressed Cas9 protein. And we then subjected these um, Ramos B-cells to a fluorescent antigen internalization assay that allowed us to sort uh, cells that internalized very little of the antigen or a lot. And by comparing these by DNA sequencing, we can then quantify the effect of each gene on internalization by using uh, this modified CRISPR score that we called internalization score. This is how the results looked like when we plotted the internalization scores against the um, statistical significance um, of the genes. We used two different uh, libraries in these screens, and while there was a significant overlap between the results, there was also a number of differences. So to be able to validate as many genes as possible, we decided to take um, top 200 genes from either of these screens and design a smaller validation library. The increased statistical power of this smaller library allowed us to robustly identify about 80 genes that were implicated in regulation of antigen uptake uh, in these cells. And this is the first um, comprehensive mapping of the um, endocytic and intracellular trafficking pathways in B cells downstream of the B cell receptor. Um, quite surprisingly, um, the genes identified cover quite um, a wide range of predicted biological functions as shown in this cell model on the right. But I want to focus today on just one of them um, to illustrate um, their importance for the immune response. And the, genes that, the gene that we focused on uh, was called SH3GL1. SH3GL1 encodes a protein called endophilin A2, which has recently been implicated in mediating um, clotrin-independent um, endocytosis. And by studying this protein, we could indeed establish that the B cell receptor is using this endophilin-mediated endocytosis in addition to the previously known clotrin-mediated endocytosis. And just to illustrate the importance of this novel endophilin A2-mediated endocytic pathway um, for B-cell responses, 
I want to show you a couple of results from endophilin deficient mice. So we first validated that the B cells from endophilin deficient mice have slower uptake of antigen. By using GFP labeled um, endophilin, we could also establish that um, the endophilin forms endocytic spots uh, on B cell membrane, uh, colocalizing with, with antigen, but forming independently of clatrin. Um, the spleens of these um, endophilin deficient mice were smaller because they had less B cells. And these uh, B cells were poor to respond to antigen stimulation. So after immunization, there were, there were lower numbers of um, activated antigen specific B cells and the production of antigen specific IgG was decreased. So the screen identified a novel clotin independent endocytic pathway a downstream of the B cell receptor that is um, essential for B cell responses to antigen, particularly at a step that requires interaction uh, with T cells. And for the future, we are interested in understanding exactly how endophilin A2 works in B cells and whether um, in addition to the B cell receptor mediates trafficking of other cargoes that may be important for B cell responses. The second screen I want to show you is focused on the signaling downstream of the receptor that regulates the, the fate decisions that B cells make during responses. And in particular, it's focused on the fact that as B cells are activated, they switch their membrane immunoglobulin of the BCR from IgM to other uh, isotypes such as IgG, IgA, and IgE. And it's known that the identity of this membrane immunoglobulin alters the signaling networks downstream of the BCR and it influences um, the fate decisions that these class switched B cells make. But it's not clear exactly how these differences are encoded in the signaling networks. So we focused on IgE, the least abundant, but also least understood of these isotypes. To screen for genes that regulate IgE B cell responses, we used a modified guide RNA library that um, contains mCherry as a marker. And we transduced this library into primary B cells isolated from mice that express Cas9 protein uh, labeled with GFP. And so when these cells are cultured um, in, um, in a feeder-based culture that mimics T-cell help, these B-cells switch to express on their surface either IgG1 B-cell receptor or IgE B-cell receptor. And each of these B-cells can be induced to differentiate into plasma cells. So by sorting these four populations and comparing them um, by CRISPR score calculation, we could infer the importance of individual genes um, on the IgG, IgE B cells compared to their IgG1 counterparts and also on the process of plasma cell differentiation. This slide shows the results by plotting the CRISPR scores for the individual populations focusing on the IgE B cells. On the left is a comparison between IgE B cells and the IgG1 B cells. And this analysis identified um, some common essential genes required in both of these populations shown in red, and these are expected from the immunology in the system. But it also identified genes that were selectively involved in IgE cells, either suppressive or essential shown in orange and green. And these sets of genes mostly um, were centered on apoptotic pathways. We could also analyze differentiation of the IgE B cells into plasma cells showed on the right. And this analysis again identified some known regulators of the process, but also identified a large number of genes that were unexpected and uh, that we analyzed further. Through pathway analysis and validation, we could link these genes into two pathways shown here in this slide. So on the left side, mostly in blue, is a positive regulatory pathway mediated by mTOR signaling. And on the right is a negative regulation of IgE plasma cell differentiation by calcium signaling. And the, the negative role of calcium was really surprising as previously calcium was thought to be a universally positive um, signal in, for B cell activation. But our results predicted that calcium signaling particularly through calcineurin is actually um, inhibitory for IgE B cells.
To validate the results in vivo, we designed um, a system for rapid gene targeting in mouse hematopoietic stem cells, which upon transplantation can be then traced uh, through um, uh, immune cell development and responses to immunization. And the system works very well. It's very specific and efficient. We use CD4 targeting um, as a control, which does not affect uh, the numbers of B cells, but does um, abrogate the presence of CD4 positive T cells. And then here we are targeting the essential regulatory subunit of calcineurin encoded by PPP3R1. So you can see that also has an effect on T cells and that's expected from the literature. But the critical result is the targeting of this calcineurin subunit increases the number of IgE positive plasma cells upon immunization while not changing um, the numbers of IgG1 plasma cells. So indeed, calcium is an inhibitory pathway for um, IgE responses. In summary, this CRISPR screen provides the most comprehensive identification of genes essential for class-switched B cell responses to date. It allowed us to do a differential analysis to identify genes selectively involved in IgG1 or IgE B cells. And together with this uh, in vivo validation pipeline, I think can provide us new ideas how to target um, these um, individual class switched B cell responses selectively. And this can be interesting, uh, for example, in selective dampening of IgE responses in allergy. This is all I wanted to show you and brings me to my conclusions. The pooled CRISPR-Cas9 screens are currently the most efficient way to carry out genome-wide functional studies. And I think the results are so efficient that they go beyond just identification of rare hits in those screens, but they really can be used to measure gene effects on a variety of cellular functions. The screens are directly applicable to primary cells and can be carried out in disease contexts. And there's some exciting ways how to extend them in the future, just beyond uh, improvements in the design and statistical analysis. For example, um, there are now designs to carry out these screens using single cell sequencing for transcriptional readout in the individual cells and for mapping on, on of transcriptional circuits. Um, the screens are also compatible with dual targeting, which um, allows high throughput mapping of gene interactions. And they're also compatible with um, modified Cas9 proteins, for example, to carry out CRISPR-I or CRISPR-A type of um, uh, gene targeting or transcriptional modulation. And finally, um, I, I think that uh, public sharing of the screen data uh, really provides another level of analysis that cannot be carried out in a single um, lab and allows meta-analysis that can identify context-specific genes um, in a really uh, efficient way. Finally, I want to acknowledge the people in the lab who did the experiments I showed you today. Despite the relative simplicity, the genome-wide screens are still a huge amount of work. Um, uh, Desi Malinova, um, a former postdoc in the lab, uh, carried out the endocytic screens and all the in vivo uh, follow-up. And she was helped by Labia Vasim, uh, who did um, the endophilin imaging. And Becky Newman uh, is a postdoc in, in the lab who is carrying out uh, the IgG1 and IgE screens with the in vivo uh, follow-up. I also want to thank um, our funders and our collaborators and you for your attention. Thank you very much.